Next up, we have our keynote speaker for today. His name is Nick Yerod Yakonu. Did I see Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, I said I wasn't going to be proud of myself if I said that properly. Next guy, Bob Smith. That's who we're getting. <laughs> Nick, so here's the thing. I've, I've keynoted a few conferences, and when I go there, I make these demands. I'd be like, I need just a bowl of blue M&Ms, and I need a massage beforehand, and if I see any people wearing green, I'm not going on stage. I am the biggest prima donna, you cannot believe. Nick got here, he's so nice. He came all the way from England, he shook hands, he's made nice with everyone, it's, it's fantastic. So I have to say, of the keynote speakers I've met, including me, Nick is fantastic, and I think what he's gonna show you today is, is uh, not only inspiring, but actually the sort of thing that, that's gonna make you wanna go out and be a better person. So, without further ado, here's Nick. Yano Diakonu, Yero Diakonu. Well, thank, thanks a lot for that, Aidan. Can you hear me? Is that coming across? Yeah, well done on the name. He only had to practice that about 100 times before he came up here. But he's a quick learner because it took me a few years to get it right. Um, it's an English name I haven't heard before. Well, it's Greek Cypriot. So I'm, I wear many, many hats, as you'll see. Um, I'd just like to thank SketchUp and Trimble for having me here today. It was, a, it was definitely an unexpected honor to be invited along to, to talk, uh, and I'm really looking forward to finding out what all the amazing things people are doing with, with SketchUp over the next few days are. Um, so my name is Nick Iorodiokonu, as you've just heard, and I'm an architect, um, but I'm also a web designer, and I dabble in furniture design from time to time, and, uh, and, um, and over the last few years, I've been involved in co-founding a number of web platforms and, uh, and an internet startup. And I do all this whilst working for one organization, and that organization is called Zero Zero. So I've been invited here today to talk to you a little bit about what we do, because we're quite an unusual um, practice, particularly for a practice that grew out of architecture and the built environment. And so I'm going to show you some examples of our work today, and I'm going to talk about how we came to collaborate with SketchUp. Um, and then in closing, I'm going to go really big picture uh, and get very serious, and I'm going to try and sort of present a, a sort of broader image of, of what I think design is, is really about, what the big remit of design is, is in the world. So who are... Zero, zero. Well, we're a strategic design practice based in London, and we work across sectors to deliver socially sustainable platforms, projects, and places. And this is us. There's 19 people. We're a multidisciplinary team of architects, designers, uh, urbanists, social policy researchers, technologists, and we've even got a, uh, a developmental psychologist amongst us. And we work with a whole range of other collaborators from different disciplines on different kinds of projects. Now, we're a limited company, we're a for-profit company, but we are also a non-hierarchical organization. So we believe that no individual or subset of individuals should disproportionately profit from the, the outputs of, of the collective. So the way we, we run our, our company is we've taken our governance and our equity, which would typically be the same thing represented by the same shares, and we've split them all up. And what we've done is we've put our equity in trust. We've locked it away so it's non-transferable. So effectively, the, the equity shareholders of the company can't um, draw dividends on assets or sell specific assets created by the collective. All of that is controlled by the voting share. And what we do is we distribute voting shares to all the members of, of Zero Zero. And we do that on a model of accrual. So over a period of time, everyone acquires um, voting shares from the first day that they become a member to a point in time where they reach a level which is the same as everybody else. And the only thing that changes here is the, the amount of years of experience that people bring into the company and, um, and the amount of years they've actually already invested into it. But ultimately, it ends up in a position where everybody has a kind of equal say in how, in how assets are generated and how the work is carried out and what's distributed. And this is all backed up by very liberal culture, so we, we operate a model where we try and push decision-making to the edges of the organization as much as possible to allow people to experiment and to innovate, but still be accountable and still have a, a sort of overview of the collective health of the organization. And the reason we do all this is that we're trying to build a, a company around real long-term value, both for ourselves, but also hopefully for the wider world. We're trying to sort of nurture talent and innovation within the collective, um, and, and what this allows us to do is basically work on a much more diverse range of projects than would typically be the case. So 
On one side of the spectrum, we do stuff like this, built architectural projects. Uh, this is a three million pound, 16,000 square foot uh, community center and managed workspace in Sheffield in the UK. It's called the Manor Development Company. And uh, it's, it's for a charity which effectively provide employment opportunities. So it's, it's got works, workshops and, and office spaces in it. At the other end of the spectrum, we do things like this. So research publication work. This was a piece we did in 2012. It looks at the effects of the mass house building market in the UK, and it makes proposals for how to empower more self builders and how to put more land into community ownership through what's called community land, land trusts. But we even do uh, web projects. So this is a project called the Civic Crowd. It's kind of like a local community Kickstarter. So it allows you to post up a project that you're working on in your, in your neighborhood and then get crowdfunding donations and volunteers to come in and support you and effectively capture that activity to evidence your impact and hopefully get more support from councils or, or other sorts of backers. And this was done with the support of a non-governmental organization and a, and a housing association, interestingly. So as you can see, we do a kind of range of, of different kinds of work, and we work with a range of different clients. But we also do something which I think is really unusual uh, for a practice that came out of architecture, because every so often we incubate and we spin out a, a new subsidiary business. And this is, this is one example. This is called the Impact Hub Westminster. And it's a big shared workspace, about 12,000 square feet, uh, right in the center of London, just around the corner from Trafalgar Square in Piccadilly. And uh, it's one of a network of 56 hubs around the world, and their, their sort of aim is to provide affordable workspace and networking opportunities for young businesses, uh, particularly social enterprises, businesses with a sort of social, social vision. Um, and actually, this is something we helped develop. We didn't just do the fit out on this, but we also did the biz business planning and, and we were involved in the early operational side. So we actually hold a stake in this business. We developed it alongside a local council, Westminster City Council. And it's also where we base ourselves. So this is actually the office. And about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, actually, in, in April 2013, I was sat at my desk just here, and I got an email. I got an email from Chris Cronin, who's, I believe he's somewhere in the room here. Um, Chris works on, on business development for SketchUp and Trimble in Europe. And he contacted us because he wanted to discuss a potential collaboration make a fair later that year in New York, and it was about a project that he'd, that he'd seen. So what I'd like to do now is basically tell you the story of that collaboration. Specifically, I'd like to tell you about three projects which fit into the story and, and explain how it is we came to, to, to work on with SketchUp and, and what it is we actually did. So the first of those projects, um, and the thing that actually prompted Chris to contact me in the first place, uh, was this. It's called WikiHouse. WikiHouse is an open source construction system. And it began back in 2011 when Zero Zero were invited to an international design festival called the Gwangju Design Biennale in South Korea. And one of the themes of, of that, that exhibition was open source communities. And we found this really interesting because at about the same time we got invited to this, we'd been doing our own research, which would feed into the, the right to build publication I mentioned earlier, and it was looking at prohibitively high land value and, and the difficulty of pe that people having to access the housing ladder and things. And, um, and it struck us that, as we looked at these sorts of things, that actually there was, a, there was a strange sort of divergence occurring within the field of architecture. Because increasingly, the kind of work we were doing didn't really reflect the kind of buildings that majority of the world's population actually live in. And it didn't even reflect the kinds of buildings that we ourselves as architects could afford to procure ourselves. So we felt like, yeah, architecture is increasingly working for this minority, this 1% or percent of 1%. So in the context of thinking about this, thinking about open source was something we wanted to explore. Now, at a similar sort of time, a few colleagues and I had been getting into digital fabrication. Specifically, we've been looking at 3D printing and CNCing. So we looked at things like the falling cost of 3D printers, and we looked at projects like the RepRap, the self-replicating 3D printer open source project. And we looked at the Blackfoot, which is a self-assembly kit for a CNC machine made from parts cut on another CNC machine. And it struck us that what these projects were doing was basically completely lowering the threshold for access to precision fabrication, effectively democratizing production. And we thought, you know, this is incredible. This could be what the factory of the future looks like in garages and, and maker spaces around the world like this. So when we got invited to Korea, we thought, well, let's do this. Let's do an open housing project which leverages digital fabrication. So we set ourselves a challenge. We had 12 weeks in which, in which to prepare. We wanted to create a kind of end-to-end -end process that would basically combine accessible files, online sharing, the ability to upload and download files from a website, with accessible design tools. You can see where I'm going with this. Um, tools that would be easy to learn and ideally free to access. 
and then look at recyclable accessible materials, things that would be standardized and you know, ideally similar in different parts of the world, combined with digital fabrication, accessible fabrication technology, and then finally look at accessible assembly, the ability to put something together with limited uh, skills, limited tools. And Wikihouse is what we came up with. So how does it work? Well, Wikihouse is a, an online platform which allows people to share designs for house-type structures to a website, wikihouse.cc. And then it allows other people to browse that website and find, find designs that they want and then download them and then open them in this little bit of software, which is SketchUp, of course. And it was our accessible tool of choice and it sort of won hands down when we looked around for, for sort of simple to learn 3D modeling packages that people could get into and use. We then worked with a collaborator, Tab, who um, Tab wrote this amazing plugin in Ruby, which created a set of, of WikiHouse tools. And what those tools allow you to do, as well as upload and download designs from the Wikihouse website, like this, is they provide a, a button that's a make this house button. And what that button effect effectively does is it takes the compiled 3D model and it attempts to project all the parts into 2D and then lay them out so that you end up with all the components on standard rectangular sheets like this, and you get something that looks very similar to this. And what those represent is effectively sheets of standard materials like plywood. So you then take those vector drawings, you feed them into CAM software to control a CNC machine, and with a bit of post-production, you end up with this puzzle, puzzle of parts. You lay those puzzles, those puzzle parts out on the ground, and you, and you form effectively a kind of portal frame. And this all goes together without any power tools because it uses just some simple wedges and malleting, and the mallets themselves actually come cut out of the sheet of ply, so everything, everything comes in a set. And you then hoist up the portal frames and you connect them all together with these sort of lateral members and you end up with, with a sort of building skeleton in whatever design you've, you've started with or tweaked. And you then overclad that with sheets of ply which are slotted back and screwed back to the subframe and you end up with a kind of basic house shell. And that's then ready for things like glazing and, and insulation within the cavities and services like plumbing and electrics and so on and finally some weatherproofing. And hopefully you've, you've ended up with a sort of rudimentary kind of house. Now, what that actually looks like in practice before the cladding and the services and, and things is something like this. So the structure on your left there is actually the structure that Chris saw when he came in to visit us at the hub. And it's one of the first prototype wiki houses we put together. It's currently used there as a kind of meeting house, uh, meeting room, sorry. And on the right, we have a prototype that we, we put together from Milan Design Week in, in Italy. But prototype structures like this have actually been built all over the world. And what we find time and time again with this is that it's, it's an incredibly kind of social process. It's really fun putting together a wiki house. So people come together who've never done this before and they figure it out in teams and they end up putting, putting up one of these things in a relatively short space of time. And usually they could then do it repeatedly without any additional guidance beyond, beyond the first build. And what, what is also interesting about this is every time one of these gets built, we're learning something new about material tolerances, local climatic conditions, and how these kind of structures behave structurally in response to stresses and strains and things. And so, in a sense, the system is being improved every time one of these gets built. Now, of course, there's a lot of things here which aren't new or innovative at all, because we've been doing things like this, community barn raising, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And one could even argue that, that things like um, vernacular architecture, sort of methods for constructing in the past, passed down by communities from generation to generation, nothing more than a kind of open source sort of method of, of sharing information. It's just that with the advent of the internet, those communities are now globally connected and they're working around the clock. So with Wikihouse, we have teams all over the world who are working on their own local problems, their own solutions to those problems, and they're all subscribing to a kind of constitution where they, they share back their learning so that everyone else can benefit from that learning. And some of those contributors are really pushing things way beyond where, where we saw them going. So in the top left corner there is the Wikihouse New Zealand team. And what they're actually doing is making this system anti-seismic. So they, they've changed the structural logic from where we started, and they're building structures that they can then use in places like Christchurch as post-disaster relief housing. And the other thing they're doing which is really interesting is that they're trying to make a, a, a effectively a, a business model around Wikihouse, whereby they share what they develop and learn, and they leverage the sort of learning from others in an open source way, but then they offer architectural services hung off of that system. So they try and reap some efficiencies out of using things like Wikihouse, knowing that they can still be approached by people who, who want to procure services from them. 
Eric Schimmelfenig, who's just sat down here in the front row, has been doing some really amazing stuff with Wikias. He only has been familiar with the system for, I think it's less than a year, a few months now, really, since October. Um, and he's basically taken our modeling standards in SketchUp. He's really improved them. He's, he's, he's a much better modeler than I am. So he, what he's doing is things like screencasts shared to YouTube about, about the best ways to do this. But he's also working with Vectric, who make CAM software, CNC software. And they're actually, their collaboration is what has resulted in this structure here. Effectively, they're working on plugins for their software, especially designed to solve some of the problems around tolerances and things when you try and put one of these things together. So you should be able to get to an end-to-end -end process where you go from a design to a finished buildable structure. On the right here, we've got a project called Foundhouse, which actually started just down the road in, in Denver in the University of Colorado by two students, Patrick Bester and Lacey Williams. And what they've done is, I think, probably the first actual habitable Wikihouse structure. And this is actually, this was built to house um, students in temporary accommodation out in Utah for a project that they were doing out there to, to do a sort of design build um, exercise. And, and they were actually staying in there, and it was a pretty nice place to stay. Of course, this is all just the beginning, because there's a whole load of house-related systems which one can imagine developing out and sharing in the open. So we've been working on, on wiki windows, which are basically similar logic to wiki house. They're just layers, laminated layers of plywood um, designed to take weather proofing and also uh, you know, units of double or triple glazing. And one can kind of see where all this is going, particularly, I think, when we see what some of the amazing stuff that SketchUp Warehouse is doing at the minute, for example, because you can kind of imagine a scenario where we, we work together to share solutions for really fundamental needs, because I do think things like housing are a fundamental right, um, in the open, in a way where it can be adapted and, and improved by a whole community of people, and where they, they provide genuine, important utility. Now, of course, sharing designs isn't the only thing required here to sort of enable this kind of vision. There's also the fabrication itself, amongst other things. And whilst working on WikiHouse, we realized that whilst it, you know, the narrative worked and, and we had the various components in place and we were quite pleased with the process, in, pra in actual fact, not everyone obviously has access to CNC technology and we realized that in some cases it's actually not that easy to find a CNC, which brings me on to the next project that I'd like to talk about. It's called uh, FabHub. So this is FabHub. It's, uh, it's a website. It's an online directory of digital fabrication service providers around the world. And we launched this uh, early last year, in early 2013. And what we wanted to do was provide a way for digital fabricators, sort of high value manufacturers, independent makers, but also fab labs and tech shops and facilities like that, to basically share their capacity, share their resource. Um, because what we, what we sort of realized is that although there are a whole range of forums and other sites out there for digital fab enthusiasts, um, not many of them provide a kind of layer of curation of, of easy navigability around how you, you kind of find a fabricator. What we wanted to do was bring that curation so it would be easy for designers, other makers, other businesses to come along, look for a digital fabricator searching by location, so this is proximity to a particular place, and then work with them. And this is what it looks like when you get into a digital, uh, sorry, digital fabricator's profile on FabHub. Effectively, it's used to show off the kind of work you do, to talk about the history of your company, to explain what kind of machinery you use in your process, but also you can do things like even show the preferred file formats you work with, and all this is intended for people to be able to make inquiries to offer you work, and it's a completely free service to list on. This is an example, actually, from a small maker in, in a forest in France, and they happen to accept SKP files as their preferred format. So we did all this partly because we were kind of getting frustrated in the process of working on Wikihouse and other pro projects in London, looking at CNC, as I say, in trying to find, um, find the service providers. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of them were already busy working within a kind of B2B supply chain, and they weren't necessarily public facing, they weren't customer facing, it wasn't necessarily too easy to find, and many of them didn't even have a website. So we chose to do this, but it was whilst doing this that we came across another question which we really wanted to ask, and I think it's a slightly kind of more interesting or deeper question about this whole space, and it was basically this. We asked ourselves, to what sort of economy for designing and making does this new capability for digital production, digital manufacturing all around the world point? Is this the new supply chain, and can it ever compete? Because it struck us that the way we designed and made many of the products that surround us today, the 20th century model, if you like, looks a lot like this. Money flows into product development. That's usually a slow and costly process. Whenever a design is deemed ready, it goes into mass production, typically where the land and labor is cheapest on the other side of the world. 
And then products get shipped large distances back to the high street and then get retail, generate revenue, the wheel goes round and round. And what that does in practice is it concentrates talent and resources in local demographic and geographical clusters. But what happens when we start to imagine a world where the production gets really distributed and as a result it starts to come close to home? Are we looking at a scenario like this where basically design becomes the commodity where effectively through digital rights management, file encryption and, and sort of solutions like that, we manage to hold on to design in a way that it becomes very difficult to fabricate things, for example, without prior consent, but where the fabrication is more distributed, you get more of a kind of lean manufacturing sort of extension. Or are we looking at something more like this, where basically people start to more readily give away information, they, they kind of give up on, on the idea that they're protecting their intellectual property up front. But then the question with this model is, well, how is this economy fueled? Who's actually paying for what in this kind of scenario? Well, we really wanted to explore this, and we had a sense of what the kind of incentives were in the open hardware space, doing things like Wikihouse, and we had a bit of a sense from talking to makers on Fabul about the kind of B2B side of things. But we wanted to see if we could generate something that sits in the middle, which basically provides a, a layer of transparency, of openness, but also deals with monetary exchange and deals with, with transactions. And so we asked ourselves this, can we build a business model for open making? Can we provide incentives for the various actors in the story, the designers, the makers, the end users, to kind of interact with each other, to transact, but within a kind of open philosophy? And this is where the last project that I want to talk about um, comes in, and that's OpenDesk. So this is OpenDesk designed for open making. It's a website which offers workspace furniture, which is designed to be made locally all around the world. And it began in about August of 2013, I think the site went live, and we started out with a range of CNC milled flat pack furniture. Um, this was actually the first piece we designed for a kind of four person workstation to be used in, in offices and, and workspaces. And we then went on and we designed a range of other pieces, meeting tables and cafe tables and stools and, and things like that. But we also teamed up with a range of, of designers uh, around the world who were thinking about similar issues, including at Fab, uh, here in the US, if you're familiar with them. So the range of products on the OpenDesk site has been growing, and we've been quite inviting. So we have a page called the Studio Page, which allows basically designers to come along and post their own designs, or people who found a design they like online to come and post it Pinterest style to sort of pin it here. And then it allows people to come along and express an interest by wanting those products. And what we do is then we do some curation, we work with the individual designers to prepare to have their things onboarded and, and ready for distributed production. Now, on the other side of the OpenDesk platform, we've got Makers. And thanks to a link to FabHub, because these sites share the same Maker API, um, we've gone from two Makers when we launched to over 180 in 32 different countries today. So how does the OpenDesk process work? Well, it's kind of similar to WikiHouse. The website hosts a range of designs for digitally fabricated furniture, and those are available to either download or to be sent directly to a, to a fabricator. You take those files in standard form, you put them through cams off and do your CNC, and you end up with a, with a bunch of parts. And those parts are ready to be ferried to where the piece is going to be assembled or finished. Um, so that's either a workshop somewhere nearby, or it's on location wherever the piece is being installed. And when you put this all together, you end up with hopefully something which is a useful, useful piece of furniture. Now, for every design on OpenDesk, you've got two choices typically. Um, you can either download it to make it yourself, and this is offered at the designer's discretion and under license terms that the designer chooses. So for example, they could choose a Creative Commons non-commercial license. But basically, if you choose to do all the work yourself, you can have the data free. Or you choose to get it made through a local maker. And depending on how mature the maker community is wherever you're located, what that means is either that we offer you a route to basically buy it now directly from one of those makers, or we put you into a kind of marketplace environment, which we're working on right now, which would allow you to have a kind of mediated communication, agree prices, delivery dates, and so on, um, and basically do some of that work yourself. Now, in places where you can just go straight in and get yourself an open desk, what you do is you first choose your delivery address. It's kind of the reverse of, of the normal process in a way of checking out for a product. You first say where you are because it's all about local making. You then choose the form that you want the product in, because by virtue of being digitally fabricated, you can kind of stop that, that previous process I was talking about at, at any point. So you could choose to just have the pieces sawn straight off the mill, ready to completely DIY yourself, or you could get the maker involved in, in various degrees of, of finishing. You choose how many you want, and you choose your material. And what's interesting there is that because 
the process is by and large similar as long as you're accounting for things like material thickness and, and, and tolerances. Different makers in different areas can offer different materials. So we actually do get, when you look at what people are offering around the world, it does vary to some extent. But things like plywood are, are, are pretty standard. And then you get presented with your makers and your price and you can kind of check out. Now, what's really important about this is that when you choose to do this, what you're actually committing to is to pay the maker for the fabrication, and that includes their materials and their labor, of course, and their machining. But you're also committing at that point to pay the designer a royalty for use of their design, and it's a royalty of the designer's choosing again. And then you're choosing to pay the platform a transaction fee, and that goes towards managing financial transactions, but it also goes towards helping manage your specific order, and then obviously to ongoing development. And that gives you a final price, and all of this is communicated transparently to you. But the most important thing is that the designers and the makers are free to basically compete on their own terms and at their own price point. Now, whilst this distributed production goes on, we allow DIYs and makers to basically post photos of what they're doing onto what we call the workshop, the open desk workshop. Because one of the things that we're really interested in here is this idea that when it comes to getting involved to whatever degree in the making of your product, whether it's choosing a maker, choosing materials, doing it all yourself, Effectively, your willingness to engage with this whole process, your willingness to even buy the products in the first place, is completely changed by your proximity to the kind of social process that makes these things. In a sense, you come to love them more, the more you're involved in the making, and the more you can see who is involved in the making. So every time you download or, or order an open desk product, you get a set of instructions on how to put it together, and they come with this QR code. And what that does is it basically links to a long, secure URL, which is particular to that one product, and it allows people to post photos and videos of them making these things into a stream, which is then publicly shareable. And it even shows you the location where each of these steps is taking place. So you can actually see your product being made up over time, and then that story can be shared. And the point about this is it's trying to say that although the process is a digital at heart, there is still this human touch involved. It's a bit like WikiHow sort of with barn raising. This is kind of like cottage industries gone 21st century, gone kind of hyperlocal. Now, through this process, we're actually able to already fulfill orders for customers in the real world. So we have customers like DigitalOcean in New York, who have a bunch of open desk furniture in their offices, Mint Digital in London, Beave and Greenpeace, and a range of other creative agencies and startups and companies. And every one of these orders is being fulfilled by a small independent micro factory like this. And typically, the products are being delivered just a few miles from where the end user is. Okay, pause for breath. So that was the stories of WikiHouse, FabHub, and OpenDesk. But to put it all into context, I'd just like to talk about what we actually did uh, at Maker Faire, because we teamed up with SketchUp, obviously, that's what I'm doing here today. But we also teamed up with ShopBot, who um, make amazing CNC machines. And we worked with Bill Young, who's a very talented maker. Um, and we decided to basically make a SketchUp WikiHouse Maker Faire stand. And about a month before Maker Faire kicked off, we started to get a little bit nervous because we, we were still in the process of designing this thing and we realized we had a lot of CNC to do. Now, what I'd like to do is tell you a little anecdote about how we were actually working because it's one of my favorite kind of visions of, of where distributed production is kind of going. We had Bill Young and Robert Bridges with their CNC machines, their shop machines in their workshops in Virginia and they were kind of ready to go, waiting to cut day and night. And we had my colleague and co-founder of WikiHouse, Alistair, sat in the office in London. And he was ready to do all the SketchUp designing. And where was I during this process? Well, I was sat on a beach catching some rays in Greece, which is not very helpful. But Greek productivity being what it is. <laughs> um, True story, I jumped on the Wi-Fi, sat on that beach, I jumped on the Wi-Fi, and we started working. And this is actually how we were working. So Alistair was working on the SketchUp model, and he was preparing it section by section until he was happy with the design. And he would then email me an attachment with that chunk of the model ready. I would then run our plugin and do a little bit of work in CAD to sort of sanitize and clean up the files. And I would then drop those files into a Dropbox folder for the other guys to pick up, for Robert and Bill to pick up. They would then do their CNCing, and they would take photos of the CNCing and then post them back into the Dropbox so that we could keep an eye on what was going on and make sure that they weren't missing any pieces out. And this was all actually happening in real time. So we managed to design and 
construct and manufacture a house within the space of two weeks over three different countries, probably a round trip of about 12,000 miles in the space of two weeks. And this was the final design. One SketchUp model, 1,150 individual parts which were modeled as 150 component types. And in the real world, it was made of 175 sheet supply and it took two shop block machines, two weeks to cut. And that whole model was delivered to New York in two crates, which were just slightly larger than a sheet supply and about four feet tall. And all the on-site assembly was done by a team, most of whom I think are in this room. I think there must have been about 10 volunteers. And most of these people had never been involved in any sort of construction work before, and none of them, apart from ourselves, had ever used or weren't familiar with the WCAS, had never used the system before. But this whole thing basically went up in, in two days, and by the end of it, yeah, they were doing it much better than I was doing. Um, and what was incredible about this was that after it was completed, incidentally, it was a very popular stand. It was sort of busy to this extent pretty much all the time from the beginning to the end of the fair. But what was amazing was that after the fair ended, um, because everyone was in a rush to grab a beer, we managed to take this whole thing down, I think, just over two hours, and it was already crated up from, from assembled. So that was fun. This is almost real time. <laughs> this is after the coffee and before the beer. <laughs> okay. But the story doesn't quite end there, because as if we hadn't had enough of these kind of just-in-time experiments for this point, we decided to do this for OpenDesk. Just before I left from London for New York, I took an OpenDesk design and I sent it to a maker that I found on FabHub, machine made, and I asked them to prepare one table for us, and I gave them just one week's notice on this. And they did it, and they delivered this table, which was designed in London, ordered from London, made up in New York, and it was a beautiful thing, and it arrived the day before the gates opened to the public. But what's most interesting about it is this, the delivery radius, because it was just seven miles. That's a 15-minute car ride. And in addition to that piece, um, Eric and Bill put together a range of other pieces by AppFab, which filled out the space and made for a kind of cozy place to prop laptops up and things. OK, so that was the, uh, that was the story of Maker Faire. Um, in New York, and now you've kind of got some idea who Zero Zero are, and you've seen some examples of our projects. And in the context of these three projects, I hope you can see that for us, none of this is about um, sort of just open source or just closed source. It's not about just the sort of monetary economy versus the social economy. It's a kind of combination of themes which we're exploring that we're interested in. Because I do think that's, that's one of the sort of very interesting things about this whole space as it's emerging is that there are a whole load of opportunities to apply kind of design and making thinking in a way which leverages both some of the open sort of sharing economy side of things, but also actually can provide real business opportunities, whether that's things like, um, you know, architectural services hung off an open source construction system or, or a platform that cuts out so the middlemen and puts more onus into the hands, hands of the little guys. So how is it within Zero Zero that we sort of think about these projects and how do we end up in these kind of places? Well, we like to talk about these three Ps when we're doing, doing work at the office, platforms, protocols, and prototypes. Platforms are basically the, the kind of tools. We like to think of pretty much every project that we're trying to build as a platform of one sort or other. It's about basically building capabilities and it, it affects the way we actually interact. So when we, when we think about things like um, what Google and GitHub do for online collaboration, but equally obviously what SketchUp are doing for design, we start to see things which are kind of tools but effectively rely on the input of their end users to create the real ecosystem. And in that regard, I think, I think of them all as platforms. Protocols are basically the cultural and, uh, and sort of um, behavioral norms which define the way we interact. And in a sense, if the platform is the kind of water we're building, the kind of protocols are the why. What are, we, what are the sort of outcomes we're trying to behaviorally deliver on? And what is it that we want to do in order to hold ourselves accountable to those outcomes? And then protocol, pr and prototypes, sorry, are obviously a way to, to develop, which assumes you're going to get it wrong the first time, which assumes you're going to change and iterate as you go along. And they're kind of the fastest way, fastest way to learn. Okay, so that's all well and good, but what's our ultimate out, our sort of ultimate aim? What's the outcome we're trying to get to? 
Well, to a large extent, it has to do with the role we perceive that design plays in the world in general. And it's all about trying to do things which we think deliver some bigger purpose. So obviously we're interested in ideas, we're interested in things that are innovative and new, but we're also interested in the reason for actually taking these things on and trying to deliver them. And for a bit of steer on this, I'm going to turn to the words of, of a great man who's a kind of hero of sorts, although he's not your typical designer's hero, because he's the father of management consultancy, he's typically, I think, considered. It's this man, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker had this amazing ability, he's no longer with us sadly, had this amazing ability to preempt things that would be changing in the world of business, in the world of management, to sort of see new trends emerging. And he was very interested in innovation and he would sort of provide a lot of guidance on how businesses should prepare for disruptive innovation affecting them, but also how they should build the right culture internally to deliver on, on innovation. And he used to say that culture uh, eats strategy for breakfast. And he wrote things like this, innovation is the specific instrument of entrepreneurship, the act that endows resources with a new capacity to create wealth. So he really understood the need for businesses to remain innovative, to be responsive, for the enterprise to be responsive to change. But he also shared a lot of guidance on the kind of moral and ethical position of the individual and the corporate within society. And as early as 1939, he wrote this. So just after the Great Depression, Effectively, he came in and reminded us that two opposing economic worldviews both fail to deliver equality. So on the one hand, we can't assume that human incentives are just flattened to be to sort of nullified to just be the same thing. It simply doesn't work. But on the flip side, we have to remind ourselves that wealth generation doesn't necessarily lead to, to sort of common good. Well, okay, that was quite a while ago. We've definitely made progress since then. You know, our particular brand of globalization of capitalism is led to more opportunities, it's, it's led to more diversity, it's led to more plurality. So we must be getting somewhere. Well, yes and no, because exactly 60 years after writing that previous piece about the end of economic man, Peter Drucker came back and reminded us that the commons don't just look after themselves. The civil society infrastructure that we put into place has to be conceived and designed in the right way, and it then has to be built and, and tended in the right way. And how do we do this with the best possible intent? Well, we all have to accept a really big dose of civic responsibility. We have to learn to become leaders beyond the walls. And I think this has probably never been more important or more per pertinent than it is today, because I think we're living in really interesting times. The world is more connected than it's ever been. Information is arguably freer than it's ever been. Our access to that information is more developed than it's ever been. And yet the more we shine a light on the sort of world we're constructing, the more we see these little paradoxes emerge in our economy and in, in our democracy. We talk about things like growth. We put huge amounts of resource into big urban developments all around the world, driving up real estate, you know, often to be afforded by a shrinking minority. But the fastest growing naturally occurring settlements, where they're actually, they're actually these, they're the shanty towns, they're the urban sprawl, they're the kind of unplanned developments. We talk about wealth. We're generating more billionaires around the world than we've ever done before. And some of the fastest rate of growth is actually in the developing world, interestingly. And yet wealth disparity is growing at an alarming rate right in our own backyards. We talk about our civil and our democratic rights. We'll support democratic revolutions all around the world, sometimes at the cost of war, and yet voter turnout and party loyalty in the democratic superpowers are falling there at an all-time low. We talk about trust, we talk about privacy. You know, we'll willingly give our personal data to companies driving billion-dollar valuations, but we harbor nascent fears about our government's own use of that same data. So the big question I think all of this throws up is what, if anything, should we be doing about these kind of challenges to our network society? Do we just leave it to the economists to mull over? Do we just rely on our technology and our science? Or do we let these guys worry about it? Well, as a designer, this is a question I ask myself a lot. And um, I basically come around to ask myself, what's my responsibility in all this? What is my remit? What is the remit of design? And I hear some people say, well, this has nothing to do with you. And they might be right. I mean, it's not what we typically get paid for as architects and designers, necessarily. Maybe we should just leave it to the economists, leave it to the scientists, leave it to the politicians. But at zero, zero, this is exactly why we get up in the mornings. Because the thing is, I do believe that what we're experiencing is a kind of structural issue. By virtue of the sorts of technologies that we're experiencing, we're suddenly 
thrown into a world where the same things that enable public protest, that allow for us to basically trade on the open markets, for us to share information openly on the internet, those same things are increasing to a rate of change which we can barely assimilate anymore. And they're bringing a kind of transparency to our lives, which I think feels frightening because we're able to see change, we're able to see things boiling over almost faster than we can act. On the flip side, we've probably never been better placed to impact positively on the world because we can suddenly deploy ideas and products at almost the click of a mouse. And so, in some ways, in answering my own question about what the remit of design is, I'd like to put forward uh, a an idea, a suggestion, which kind of draws on Peter Drucker's first quote I referenced about the role of innovation and coins his words, if I can be so bold. And I'd like to suggest that design is the specific instrument of innovation, the act that endows resources with a new capacity to create value. Because behind every great innovation, I think there's a really healthy dose of design thinking. And behind and for wealth creation, there is value creation. And the thing is, Disruption isn't just something that happens to businesses. It isn't just part of the economic cycle. It's actually something that has to do deeply with civic responsibility. Because the most disruptive, I think, innovations of the past have been the ones that have lowered thresholds, that have provided new affordances, that have changed the way we, as a society, actually interact and engage with each other. And when you think about it, this is something that brands really do well. All of our everyday interactions, our desires, the way we work with everyday tools, the things we wear, the things we choose to buy, they're all steered in some way or other by a deeper understanding of how we, we behave and, and what design value really is about. But if brands can do this so well, then why not our institutions and our leaders? And so I believe it's really the role of every designer to kind of do battle with some of the bigger forces that are out there in the world and to really think about them when they do their work. Because the thing is, we're kind of beholden to them whether we realize it or not. But rather than just sit back and wait to see whether these externalities affect us in certain ways that mean we sink or we float, why don't we preempt these things and why don't we start to act more proactively in a way that means we're creating, we're building new things that are fun and exciting, but at the same time we're trying to drive civic value. Because the thing is, I think you guys, all the people who are using platforms like SketchUp to create tangible physical things, to make new affordances, to, to build things that other people potentially never imagined. I think you guys are the ones who actually wield the real power. You guys are the ones who have the real capabilities to take something as simple as a software tool and create a whole range of different outputs that can have different kinds of behavioral effects. Taken hand in hand with a sort of civic leadership that Peter Drucker is calling for, I do believe that design is the ultimate tool in service of civic responsibility, particularly when we design for disruption. Thank you very much. Nick, that was fantastic. Who is more excited now about this stuff than they were before his talk? Absolutely. It's interesting because when we said how many of you are makers in the room, not that many people put up their hands, right? Uh, and then when we say, I'm just going to do it, how many of you are architects? Right. Isn't it kind of weird that there's this disconnect between the making of things and the designing of things? There used to be a bigger connection between these things in the past. I think what's really exciting about what Nick's doing is that there's starting to be a reconnect between the people who design the things and the people who make the things. We may actually get to a place where we have control over the world again. Thank you so much to our presenters. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon.